Hey everybody, welcome to the HR and Leadership Spotlight Show. Global provocateur. Have you ever heard that term before? Global provocateur. Well, I'm going to tell you, today's guest has been um, layered with that term, global provocateur, and I cannot wait to find out more about that. But not only does he have a lifelong passion for changing organizations and, and a history of what you would call unconventional, unconventionalness uh, in regards to activism and leadership development, but he's, I would call, I have always known him as the Einstein of training, training and development, uh, which may be an old fashioned term, but that's how I've known him. Anyways, I am pleased and excited to introduce my friend, and I've uh, known him for 30 years, Charlie Walsh. Charlie, welcome to the show. Good morning, Chuck. It's a pleasure to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, but I got I know I want to get into uh, the mug that you brought today, but I got to ask you, what is a global provocateur? Come well, on. Well, yes, provoc a provocateur is a person that is a um, pushy activist who is very uncomfortable with the status quo and will, um, in, in his or her approach to making change, will stir the pot, will disrupt comfort, will um, pull the rug out from under complacency, will throw away old models that aren't relative anymore just to test people's resolve to be differently better and to grow and to expand. And provocateurs, uh, like myself, there, there's a, a collection of us globally that do a lot of international development work. Uh, we sometimes get reputations for stirring the pot, but if this pot doesn't stir, the stew doesn't cook very well. So, uh, you know, gotcha. it kind of, kind of burns on the bottom. So I, awesome. I'm, proud, I'm proud to be a provocateur. Awesome. Well, tell us, uh, what, did you bring something for us today? What do you have? A well, mug wise. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. It's been, they've been in the news recently. It's, it's, uh, Washington Redskins mug. Yeah. And it's, uh, I've got a, a whole collection of Washington Redskins things. I was born and raised in Washington, DC, but this mug means so much more to me than just the Redskins. Right. Um, if I relied on this mug to just salute the Redskins, I mean, the Redskins haven't, you know, won a Super Bowl since 1991. Um, they had a chance to go back to the Super Bowl, but they, they got their, their, their uh, tail ends beat by the Oakland Raiders at Tampa. I don't know if you remember that game. Uh, it was a very, very cold day for that game. But, um, you know, the Redskins are in, in the middle of, of uh, becoming provocateurs, and ah. they're, they're, actually, they're actually being challenged to change their name. But the Redskin logo and, and, and what's behind the Washington Redskins – it's my hometown. That's where I grew up. And right. so it, it, it stands for more than a football symbol to me. I grew up in a, in a time in Washington, D.C., the, the mid to late 40s, the early 50s, late 50s, early 60s, where, it, and I'm not sure that the term provocateur was even known then. I really am not sure. But if you, if you were a provocateur, um, you didn't really survive too well in the streets of Washington, D.C. I, I was lucky to grow up in the neighborhood where, in the beginning, um, my parents, when I was an infant, my parents were pretty well off, but then they became not very well off, and uh, I ended up growing up in the projects. Um, actually, um, a neighborhood that half of the neighborhood was in Washington, D.C., and the other half was in uh, a very, very poor um I guess you would call it um, the slums, some people would, uh, a very poor project community uh, that was a federally funded community in, in an area called Chillum Heights. And um, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood with lots of lots of diversity. And the diversity wasn't even a term, back, a term back then. It was an assumption that you live here, you got to get along with people. You know, there's no difference between anything. The only times we ever had differences what, when was, was when, uh, I don't want you on my baseball team because you're not any good. Go sit on the bench. That's the only time that we ever got into those kind of 
those kind of, uh, you know, different squabbles. So right. there were many situations where I've learned a, a valuable lessons as a very, very, very young boy um, where I was often the minority in a group setting. So it, it's, um, and coupled with very good parents that taught me that, you know, the color of your skin, your religion, your background, your ethnicity has nothing to do with the person that you are. Nothing mm -hmm. to do with that whatsoever. I was lucky to grow up in Washington, so I salute Washington, D.C. Right. Excellent. Excellent. You know, I, I really, um, you know, why don't you, and I want to come back at uh, before the, our time today, I really want to go into the the role of the provocateurs and 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 how you how that has helped you uh, 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 send whatever messages you're sending to to organizations. But talk more about your chosen path and your passion. Yeah, you know, I know from talking to a number of people when you can find your passion, and then you can figure out a way to make money with that passion. That's gold, right? That's gold. Yeah. And I I think you've done that, right? Well, I, I, I hope that I have. Growing up in Washington, D.C., it was, um, and, and don't misinterpret this because it was a different, very different perspective back then. Things kind of exploded um, on a national level in 68. But, you know, by the time I was 68, uh, I was already out of school and I was, you know, had, had gone through a lot of things that was already in the workforce. And uh, so my my personality, my character, my reference points had already been formed. Growing up in Washington, D.C., I got a job at 12 years old. And uh, th this job is kind of the, I, I would call it the foundation for why I chose the career path that I chose. But at the time, I didn't know it. I just didn't know it. Um, I went to work uh, for a guy by the name of Albert Brooks, not the comedian, but a, a right. guy named Al Brooks who owned a barber shop. Um, and this barber shop was um, just just like two or three chairs, very small barber shop. Uh, and and I was hired by Al Brooks as a shoe shine boy. And I use the term boy, you know, it, it, with all due respect for the evolution of that term, because I was the only white shoe shine kid in the neighborhood. It was like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, so. It's uh, it gave me a way to do two things to make money because if you didn't have money back then your parents certainly certainly didn't have it, and uh, so you know to to do things you had to kind of go out and make your own money. And of mm -hmm. course, before twelve, before the shoe shine job, you we would collect soda pop bottles and you know wagons full of them and take it to the store. And back then it was a nickel a bottle. You could get a nickel a bottle for you know, returning glass bottles. They don't do that anymore in, in most states. So I got a job with Al Brooks and he taught me several things about life. Number one, accept responsibility for whatever it is you're doing. You know, positive, negative, success, failure, accept responsibility for what you're doing. If you're shining somebody's shoes, don't have shine them, shine them completely. So he taught me things like, uh, Charlie, you missed a spot on that man's shoe there. Either fix it or don't charge him anything for the shoe shine. And it, it taught me a lot about personal responsibility. The flip side of what he taught me was training. He was, he was the first person who got me involved in how to do things. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I love my parents, uh, and I guess it was their generation versus you know, my generation, my parents never taught me how to do anything. Um, they taught me how to brush my teeth and, you know, things like that, but they never taught me any life skills. And, and the schools that I went to never taught me anything beyond survival skills. So Al, Al Brooks was the first person to ever teach me things. And I was fascinated by the fact that you could show somebody how to do something. Right. It's like, Wow, that's incredible. That's pretty cool, you know. So, I, you know, I, I, I worked that job for a long time. I was pretty successful at it, and then I ended up. Um, um, Al Brooks expanded and moved his barber shop, and I couldn't go with him. So I ended up getting the job. Where I'm still living in the projects. I ended up getting the job, and, and this fascinated my father because my father and my grandparents and my great grandparents were, were all in the restaurant business, going back generations to the country of Ireland. And uh, I got a job as a short order cook 
in a place called Dot and Lou's Delicatessen. Okay. And uh, this was uh, uh, still in on the border between uh, Chillum, Maryland, and um, Washington D.C. And I, I was in at this time now. I would I just left the ninth grade and was going into the tenth grade. And I got a job as a short order cook. Now, how did I learn to cook? My father taught me how to cook at a very early age. So I knew how to do things in a kitchen environment. So th they, it was a novelty for Don and Lou's Deli to hire this, you know, high school kid. And I came in before school and cooked breakfast. I came in after school and cooked kind of what they called supper back then. Yeah. And I learned, I learned some more things about training. I trained people, other people, how to cook, how to flip burgers, how to make chili, how to make soups, how to do all kinds of things. But Don Lou taught me a very different sense of personal development, which is one of my passions. Um, not only the development of people, but the development of self. And, and I'll give you an example of how they, they taught me this, right? Now I want you to, to picture this. I'm in the I'm in the tenth grade at this time, and Dot and Lou were, I would say, independently wealthy people, right? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, they they wanted to go on vacation, and they didn't have any children. They had no children, so they called me over one one evening after work uh, to the they locked up the store and called me up front to the offices, and um, handed me the keys to the store. I said, what what's this? Well, we're going, we're going on vacation and we want you to open and run the store. This was in the summer of my 10th grade. All right. Okay. 10th and 11th grade. And I was just like panicking, you know, and, and I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll be happy to do it. My father um, blew a gourd. That's the best way to say it. He said, what? What do they do? Oh, no. So um, one of the things that they wanted me to do, and they, they had rented this huge, floor buffer. I don't know if you've ever seen the big of course, floor buffer. Sure. I mean, the real big robust ones, right? And they said, we want you to wax the floor while we're gone. So let's make a long story short. I was down there after closing one night and I asked my father to help me. And he said, no, no, no. He said, this is your responsibility. You do it. So I plugged the thing in and started it and it got away from me and it went all the way up through the aisle and busted out the whole front door and the front glass. In the oh, store. no. The whole, it just totally busted it out. And the, the it's kept spinning around and it ended up out in the parking lot in front of Dot Lou's Deli. And of course, next door to Dot Lou's Deli was Pop's Pizza Oven. And next door- I love those names. Was, yeah, well, next door on the other side was High's Dairy Store. It's an ice cream store. And uh, all these people come running out and pretty soon the police are there. And pretty soon my father's there from all the commotion. And uh, so, my father helped board up the doors and board up the windows and the police, of course, put patrols. Now, there was, you never worried about stuff like that. People weren't looting and breaking in and, you know, stuff like that. But when Dot and Lou came back, they made me pay for it. Yeah. And, and that reinforced my sense of responsibility. Fast forward now to the 12th grade. I ended up in, in, in my senior year teaching classes to support my teachers. And specifically in one area, English and drama. And it just, it solidified for me that I love this field. Yeah. I love this field. Now, I, I can recall, and this is a true story going backwards in my, in my life to my childhood. I can remember my father telling me, and I don't remember the instance, but I remember what he said to me. I was probably in maybe fourth or fifth grade. And he told me, he said, you know, I can imagine that you probably came out during birth telling the doctor he did it all wrong. <laughs> I was like, what? So that, that kind of stuck in my mind as, you know, well, is that, is that some aspect of training? So I, and how I to do got, it better and how to yeah, do it better. Got, exactly. And I just got, you know, into the training aspects. Um, my first job after college was, um, Actually, not with the Nixon administration. I had a, I, I call it a get ready job with a company in Washington by the name of ITT Data Services. And they were a very small subsidiary of ITT. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked for them for about a year for a, a gentleman that I met in church by the name of Paul Marcico. 
And Paul and I are still friends. I can't, I can't say we're close friends. We're still friends. But Paul taught me through ITT Data Services that I had the ability, and I didn't know this, that I had the ability to lead other people. And I, I can remember at an early age, it was not manage other people. It was lead mm -hmm. other people. And okay. I started getting doing research on it, and you know, ITT ended up losing a major government contract, and I got laid off, and I ended up going to work for Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just, you know, from there, it just I started out in software development of all crazy things. I was hired as a human factors analyst in the Nixon administration, and and got saddled with. I use that term. Uh, joyfully all right mm -hmm. got saddled with a key assignment on the cost of living council under richard nixon's economic stabilization program and the job that i had was to train people in and this is a this shows the relationship that existed in the u.s constitution between the executive office of the president and the u.s house of representatives and the u.s senate there's a branch uh, of the government called the Inf House Information and Senate Information Systems, HIS and SIS. And they have dotted line accountability to the White House for creating, at that time, creating, um, I, I, I'll use the term system, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the systems terms that we use today. Creating system links between information from the executive branch to the legislative branch and back and forth. And, and I got assigned to, through the Cost of Living Council, I reported to the Cost of Living Council and um, to training, are you ready for this? Training okay. members of Congress. Tra I got to train members of Congress. And I was going through my, my, I've got a big bookcase over here on this side that you can't see, but I was going through my papers in there last week, as a matter of fact, and I came across, across my handwritten calendar notes where I trained Congressman John Bradimus, you know, I, I trained uh, Congressman uh, uh, Robert Schuller, uh, not the preacher, <laughs> right. but I trained all these people in how to use at, at that time what were manual systems that eventually led to integrated systems. So I, I just loved it tremendously. And, uh, you know, fast forward it to, at the end, when the cost of living council ended, I got this this plaque from signed by George Schultz, the chairman of the cost of living council and secretary of labor under Nixon, jo John Dunlap, who was the director, and Jamie McLean, who was the executive executive director. I later worked with Jamie McLean in the World Bank too, but I, I share that with you because it led me to an understanding that. Training is about people. And when I left the Cost of Living Council, I mentally made a shift from away from systems to people because I was absolutely mesmerized by how a lowly guy like me could train an elected official, an elected official in the U.S. House of Representatives. So I ended up, ended up going to work for a, a, um, a company that the Cost of Living Council bought um, – electronic equipment from they bought these uh super mini computers from a company in florida called harris corporation and i ended up going to work for harris corporation in washington dc of all places the irony of it the watergate building and i worked in the watergate building for harris for two years as a trainer and i got to train clients i got to train um the harris staff and and throughout it all i got to to really solidify my passion for finding people's niche helping mm -hmm. people find what they're good at and it just it just snowballed you know i got transferred to florida with harris i ended up uh, working for harris long enough to collect a nice retirement check nice um, very good the, I, I actually uh reconnected with um the one of the members of the cost of living council um who was also the dean of the Graduate School of Business at University of Florida, where I graduated from, a uh, guy by the name of Robert Lanzalotti. And um, if Robert is no longer with us on this earth, but he, at the time, 
he was uh, the dean of the Graduate School of Business, and Harris Corporation donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a facility built up there for graduate business training. And with, with um, Bob Lanzalotti's help and the chairman of Harris Corporation's help, we implemented a five-year program at Harris called the Graduate Program in Business. And the Graduate Program in Business was intended to take engineering people. Harris was, is, and always will be an engineering company run by engineers for engineers. And at that time, they were 31,000 employees globally, pretty big company. Right now, they're about maybe 15,000. But we implemented this 12-week residency program in Melbourne, Florida, where engineers got a, an accelerated MBA from the University of Florida. And I, I always sit here and look at this stuff that I got. This is uh, the plaque of the session that I graduated from. Yeah. And then I've got like a dozen other little things here from the University of Florida. But again, my career at Harris solidified the fact that, you know what? The development of people is what makes this world go round because at the end of our lives, all we have is our competencies. And I got so excited about that. My boss from Harris left and went to Stromberg Carlson and I followed him. And I worked there until Siemens. I was the uh, global director of training and development for Stromberg Carlson, the original telephone company. And uh, I worked with them until Siemens bought them. And then lo and behold, uh, I ended up working for a company that you're familiar with, uh, Harris Corporation. I mean, uh, Universal Studios. <laughs> right. Universal Studios. And that's where we crossed paths for the first that's time. That's where we crossed paths. And, and right. uh, I know you've heard this story before, but I had no desire, push, anything to go to work for an entertainment company, uh, a theme park company, a hospitality company, whatever label people put on it back then. But I, when, when I got laid off from uh, Stromberg Carlson because Siemens bought them out and shut them down, I got a phone call that very day from then general manager uh, of Universal Florida, a guy by the Universal Studios Florida, and as you know, it was a studio, it wasn't a theme park, right? Um, Tom Williams. And uh, Tom Williams was on the board of the Heart of Florida United Way as my boss, Lou Whitney, was. And um, Tom says, I hear you got laid off. I said, what? He said, yeah, Charlie, it's a real small town. He said, Lou called me and told me that you and your whole department got laid off. And hey, I'd like you to come down and talk to me and, and uh, my people about a job here at Universal Studios. I said, Why would I want to work there? So I, I did go down and talk to him. I met a guy named Rick Larson that mm -hmm. was a very good friend of mine. And uh, they had me operate, I guess, for, and I, I can't remember the exact time, but I want to say four weeks maybe from June and sometime in June until I think it was June the 8th. It was the day right, after it was right opened. after the grand opening. And then I worked until July 9th, and on July 9th, they, they made me a full-time employee. At the same time, who became my boss came on board, a guy named Tim Arnst. And there, I was really, I was mesmerized by the fact that I could work for a company like Universal and, and be surrounded with people who cared about making other people feel good. Right. And right. it just continued to stir my passion. And, you know, I left Universal in 98 and started my own company, Hops International. And um, the rest is history. With there, I just, you know, I just got into so many global opportunities and so many uh, things that helped me to create what has become my lifelong passion. And right. that is the development of people and the development of organizations that people work in. So thinking about your journey, and that's quite a journey. Thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, that really is. And I know there's so much more. I know you have been a world traveler. You've worked uh, with the United Nations. Uh, you've helped developing countries. You've worked in other presidential administrations on both sides of the aisle. I mean, you've got an amazing story. And I'm just going to say right now, at some point, I do want to invite you back on the show in a couple sure, of weeks and absolutely. explore yeah. some of these things. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to spend some time talking about my global journeys because that's where I really became um, a pussy provocateur. Right. So that's, yeah. Very well, that's, so. 
That's where yeah. I want to go. So when you started out, you said something interesting. You said, this is where I learned that I could do something. Someone could tell me how to do, train me, and I could do it better, right? And so you were using the word training, training, training a lot. That's correct. But, but at some point, I, I, I think the word training has gone, um, I don't say away, but it has... Um, morphed, shall we say, matured, correct? And it, so it has. You know, and so leadership, organizational development, you know, in the 21st century. Charlie, we're in the 21st century now, right? So where do you see it going? What how has it changed from when you were training and learning and to do better? You were training congressmen and now you're in the 21st century. How has that matured over the years? Well, a, a little more background is, as to how it matured in our society, um, both U.S. and globally, and how it matured in my own mindset. I had a, a really key mentor beyond Al Brooks in the barbershop. And when I was working at Harris Corporation, I had been at Harris um, probably – my first month into being transferred into Florida, into Melbourne, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had a, I thought I had arrived. I was at corporate headquarters in Melbourne, Florida, 1025 NASA Boulevard on the second floor. Second floor was like, whoa, man, this is cool. Right. Being but on I, NASA Boulevard, that says something. Yeah, I know. I, w I was uh, introduced to a consultant that was working for Harris to help develop a series of management and leadership development programs. The guy's name was Robert Gardner. And Robert became my provocateur mentor. He was, and again, the term provocateur wasn't even, I don't even know that it was known back then. It may have right. been, but Robert stirred the pot with me and um, nurtured me to understand that, and, and I'm gonna try to speak in his tone, management's not leadership, leadership's not management. You gotta look at both of them. So, and I, you got to remember, this was um, the late 70s, the early 80s, 79, 80. And I'm going, what? What, what is this, you know? And, and there wasn't very much research that you could put your fingers on around this thing called leadership. And organizational development was in its infancy. Now, I did some research, and of course, back then. And as you go backwards, the term leadership development actually came out of the 1930s. And the research led me, led me to a guy by the name of Glenn Gardner, Robert Gardner's father. Glenn Gardner was one of four people who started an organization in 1934, I think, called the American Management Association. And he, he was the author of the very first textbook called, you ready for this? There's a, I got a copy of it back here. It's called The Role of the Foreman. M-A-N, mm. Foreman, right? Foreman, yeah. It was a very sexist book on the foreman in U.S. manufacturing industries in the 30s, pre-World War II. And in that book, he used the term leadership about 50 times, which was just kind of intriguing to me. So fast forward, Robert became my, my real core mentor who helped me to understand that we had to make a shift. We, this is this society and individuals that purport to be trainers. You have to make this mental shift of training be, and this was the shift for me. Training has to become the facilitation of learning. And he taught me three different levels, education, textbook knowledge, mm -hmm. training skills, how to do learning, how to decide what to do. Oh, how to make right. a difference okay. so from education to training to learning so i started developing my own um mental catalog for being what i i later wrote a series of white papers on this called learning facilitation and along the way robert dropped another mentor in my lap a guy named dick Pryor. you met dick Pryor. dick uh dick just celebrated his 85th birthday and he's uh He's also one of those mentors that helped me to get that. So where, so where are we going today? Um, there, there has to be a lot of fundamental shifts made in the mindsets of people that lead organizations that allow people that educate, train, and facilitate learning to stir the pot, 
to be the provocateur. Here's why. And, and please understand, I'm not making excuses for the past because it worked. Right. But post-World War II, there was a textbook written out of Harvard uh, by a guy named Peter Drucker, a young professor at Harvard, wrote a book called Management. And the premise of the book was that management's job in post-industrial nation, World War II military models is to direct and control people. And people, by the way, are expendable. Mm -hmm. And that book was the first. It was the first guide in this country that was adopted, not just in this country, but globally, as the roadmap for successful organizations. And it worked. Yeah. It worked, it worked through the late 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Uh-oh, things started happening in the 70s, the oil embargo. Um, it was just one of those things that the provocateurs in other countries were stirring the pot in the U.S. Global competition automobile industry, technology, everything was coming against us and taking away world, global dominance and all the things that we had to do. And one mm -hmm. of the things that stood out like a sore thumb to me was a gentleman by the name of Edward Deming. I don't know if you ever heard of Edward Deming. He's, no. he's, um, he's been, uh, I guess, in, I hope he's in heaven for many decades, but he was, he was labeled the father of the quality movement. Now, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that I was one of the very first graduates here in Orlando of the Crosby Quality College. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, but, sure. But Deming, Deming was instrumental in working with U.S. industries, primarily General Electric, <laughs> i.e. DuPont, to try to get a focus on, hey, guys, we're headed towards the end of the 20th century. We're going in from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. We're looking at the future. We're getting beat to death in the marketplace by the Japanese and the South Korean industries. They're mm -hmm. killing us. Let's do something about it. And 99% of American industry told Peter Drucker, You're, you, it's not going to fly. No, 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 no. We're not changing the way we did things. Look how we became. I mean, you can't pull the rug out from things that work. You can't, right. you know, you can't break things. So here's what Deming did. He went to Japan. He sold his um, bill of goods to the Japanese industry, and they beat us at our own game. Right, yeah. They beat us at our own game. So I, learned I have heard respect. that story, sure. Exactly. So I learned to respect from, from Deming's early days in – in quality management, and it had a lot to do with I, I was, you know, certified in quality management, that we have to change the way we do business in this country. And it's not just changing the way business is done, but it's taking Drucker's old model of management by control, management by fear, management by intimidation, management by numbers, by measurement, and getting rid of the things that no longer work, and adding things that do work, Drucker's last textbook before he died, he, he published his last book in 94, he died in 2004, I believe. His last book was not titled Management, it was titled Leadership. Oh, and, interesting. And the, sure. Exactly, and the premise of his book was, um, without paraphrasing anything in it, but the premise of his book was that book I wrote back in you know post-World War II, 1947, it doesn't apply anymore. We can't make excuses for it because it worked, but it doesn't work anymore. So let's yeah. now shift our gears and figure out how to help management be better by focusing on leadership. Yeah. One last comment, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to the direct answer on your question. I also had the opportunity in my global travels um, and doing work with uh, initially the U.S. State Department and then with um, – the U.S. Agency for International Development, and then expanded with the U.S. State Department uh, through the U.S. Embassy Network, multiple foreign governments, uh, as well as really close work with the Bush administration and the Obama administration, I had a chance to work directly with Colin Powell and uh, his staff. And, and it, what stands out in my mind that really answers the question, right? It's, it's not my experiences that answer the question. It's what Colin Powell told me about um, his mindset on leadership. I recognize this guy was a strong military leader in Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. 
he was a, a commanding officer in the field. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. military. And so he, he was instrumental in, in shifting U.S. military mindset away from management to leadership. Leadership by influence, leadership okay. by impact. So right. here, I am, here I am working with, with the State Department to try to expand some training we had done for the U.S. Agency for International Development to put together a 21-day live-in program on leadership development, not management, but leadership development for the U.S. Embassy Network around the world. And um, I said to him, what's your philosophy on, on leadership and management? He said, it's really simple, Charlie. He said, this is what you need to develop in people's minds. You can be a good manager without being a good leader, mm -hmm. but you can never be a good leader unless you've already been a good manager. Know that management is about the effectiveness of controlling things, systems, process, procedures, policy, and leadership is all about people, about how you influence and impact the role that people play in managing things. It's just yeah, really I like that. I, I had never connected the dots on that. And, and it, it allowed me to go backwards through maybe 35, 40 years of my career and push it forward. So right. the direct answer is we need, we, those of us that consider ourselves to be provocateurs, we need to combine education, training, and development and, and get people to facilitate inside organizations a shift in mindsets so that leadership complements management. It doesn't replace it to keep the good parts of management intact because you still have to measure numbers. You still have to manage things, but it, it's always in the 21st century through people that that happens most effectively. Right. And the challenge is there's a lot of otherwise noble managers in organizations all over this country, small, medium, and large, uh, private sector, public sector, that were trained in the old way of doing things. And what we have to figure out to move forward into the truly into the 21st century, now that we're 20 years into it, is that we have to figure out how to give them not only the tools of leadership, but to help them change their organizational cultures so that it fits. Right, right. And, and the ones that do will succeed. I'm always taken aback by, by individuals that are in management roles that have still don't understand that leadership. I don't know, they didn't get the memo, uh, they weren't trained right, or they haven't embraced it, and they're still living on the 1947 book, I think. Well, the, the thing we have to remember, though, and I, it, this was a hard lesson learned for me, um, and I started learning it at Harris Corporation. It really came full circle for me at Universal Studios, and then Colin Powell reinforced it significantly for me. We can't blame those people because they never had the opportunity. Maybe in some cases they didn't take the opportunity, but they were trained and educated in their comfort zones to manage for effectiveness things, mm -hmm. things. And, and another lesson I learned from, from uh, the State Department, uh, in particular, uh, someone who is still hard at work in the State Department in the country of Zimbabwe, a good good friend of mine. Um, the difference between effectiveness and efficiency. And I, I'd always thought that they, well, those are the same things. No, they're not. No, they're not. Efficient is is deciding what's the right thing to do. And and in the 21st century, is the right thing to get a thing done that drives the bottom line, or is the right thing to, to work with people to get them more motivated, to get them more engaged, to get them more focused on doing the right thing on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, e effect, e efficiency is figuring out what's the right thing to do. And then effectiveness is doing it to the best of your ability. I like that. Listen, I, I got to tell I you. I never knew it. I got to tell you, believe it or not, we are running down on time. I want to have you back. I want to know more about the role of the provocateur, how 
provocateur, right? How someone can become a true provocateur. Uh, your global versus U.S. Um, leadership uh, experience, and I know you're involved in a leadership forum. It's incubating leaders. And there's a mission with that. There is so much more uh, regarding leadership and the provocateur. Would you agree to, to come back in a couple of weeks? Absolutely, because those things that you just mentioned continue to do what um, has really become my lifelong passion. And that's to keep feeding those passions that originally formed my foundation of why I do what I do. If you that's don't awesome. feed them, they die. If you don't feed them, they die. So Trevi, I'd be happy to come back. That'd be awesome. Now, just uh, if you could let us know, and I'll put these in the show notes, but if anyone wanted to get hold of you to, um, to possibly help them um, affect some organizational uh, change and development, how, how could they get hold of you? Well, they, we, we have a website and we have an email address. I don't like to give out the phone number. My phone number is available on the, on our website. Our website is, located at www.hops, that's H-O-P-S hops, I-N-T-L, international, H-O-P-S-I-N-T-L.com. Uh, and we also have a, you can reach me via my um, email address, which is uh, all lowercase, Charlie Walsh, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-W-A-L-S-H, at H-O-P-S-I-N-T-L.com. Awesome. All right, folks, I want you to join me in thanking Charlie Walsh, global provocateur, organizational change activist. Uh, this is the HR and Leadership Podcast Show. If you like it, uh, if you like what Charlie said, he will be back in a couple of weeks. So make sure you subscribe. If you are an HR leader uh, or just a leader in general, uh, you are a a, a consultant, a coach, and you want to get your message out, contact me. I'd love to have you on the show. The show is brought to you by Alliance HR Partners. Uh, get hrhelpnow.com. You can visit us online. Other than that, Charlie, thank you for joining us. Um, My pleasure, Chuck. Very definitely. She said, I love HR, folks. I hope you love HR. And I hope you got something out of what Charlie had to say. And he will be back in a few weeks. So we will see you then, Charlie. Thank you. Everybody stay safe. All right, folks.